elle-même euh, est moins évident. Euh, il suffit d'appuyer sur le bouton d'électricité, sur le bouton, puis euh, une unité de, 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 de l'énergie nucléaire qui sort à bon marché, qui est abondante, qui a des prix faibles. Donc forcément, ça joue certainement sur euh, l'aspect de, de la volonté locale à, à ce niveau-là. Ça a fait une forme, euh, quelque part, d'inertie au changement. Euh, par contre, euh, quels seraient les avantages de l'éolien citoyen euh, Comment est-ce que ça pourrait se développer davantage D'ailleurs, première chose, je pense que c'est l'impact que ça peut avoir sur l'acceptabilité sociale des projets. Euh, une des premières choses que me disaient les répondants, un des gros problèmes de, de, du manque d'acceptabilité sociale pour un compte en France, c'est vraiment le, ça concerne l'éolien industriel finalement, euh, qui donne un peu de mauvaise image à l'éolien. Donc par exemple, c'est aussi une cause de l'explication du soutien du, pour l'éolien de la part du mouvement écologiste, au fur et à mesure avec les élèves. Avec, avec les années, il y a eu moins de, moins de soutien de la part du mouvement écologiste. Et ça, c'est ce qui est encore plus bien par ce peu de développement de l'éolien citoyen. Euh, je peux vous donner une petite citation qui illustre euh, très bien euh, euh, ce, ce, cette problématique euh, soulevée au niveau de euh, Les coopératives en énergie aussi qui sont historiques, on va voir un petit peu avec, euh, on va faire un lien avec ce que vient de dire Evariste. Et enfin, ce dont je m'occupe tout particulièrement, ce sont les coopératives en énergie renouvelable. À ce niveau-là, je vais insister beaucoup sur l'émergence des coop en énergie renouvelable. Qu'est-ce qui a été le facteur déclencheur qui a fait en sorte qu'au Québec, ce, ce type de modèle a été développé Je vais vous en fournir quelques exemples pour vous donner un petit peu. Euh... Je parle trop vite Oui. Ok. Dommage. Ensuite, je vais vous donner quelques exemples en fait, euh, pour essayer de vous donner un peu un ordre d'idée de ce qui peut être fait. Il y a beaucoup de coopératives sont actifs dans le domaine de l'éolien, mais pas uniquement, on voit que suite au premier de il y a certaines coopératives qui ont changé un peu leur fusil d'épaule et qui essayent maintenant de, de développer d'autres types d'énergie. Des facteurs de réussite, pourquoi est-ce qu'un projet coopératif en énergie renouvelable fonctionne ou ne fonctionne pas Donc justement les contraintes et les défis, euh, voir un petit peu pourquoi est-ce qu'il y a des projets qui peuvent ne pas décoller. Et enfin, en dernier lieu, je vous donnerai euh, une certaine conclusion et les perspectives d'avenir pour le modèle globe et les énergies renouvelables. Est-ce que c'est correct Toolkit that can be used by other groups 
to, uh, to help facilitate their projects. Uh, various groups are not yet at that stage because they're still thinking of early startup. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we can try to communicate. Um, it just lists some of the, the different costs. So both on the project side and on the project side, that would be common to what the uh, private sector is experiencing. On the co-op side, I think we have a number of unique uh, expenses that, uh, that people just don't appreciate. And in, in part, I think, you know, one of the things we haven't really even grappled with is how do you how do you engage your members for a 20 year period around a project that really is just giving them, it's not even giving them electricity, it's really just an investment. And so, you know, this whole idea of communications is an interesting challenge that we're facing. Uh, and you see that managing the windshare membership, you know, it's, it's hard to get 20 people out uh, to an AGM because there isn't really a whole lot to say except you know, your turbine generated this much over the last year. Um, and so I think we'll begin, you know, we'll definitely see that as a challenge uh, going forward. Uh, uh, there is a cooperative difference in uh, alternative energy and what are the challenges. So I'll, I'll go fairly quickly through this, but really I want to focus on the last point, the value difference and the way forward for alternative energy production by forwarding what I think is a real problem for cooperative practice in theory in this new developing field. And take a step back, and, and some of it was mentioned in the, the earlier presentations, about what, what's driving this policy, this creating alternative energy, what are the problems when co-ops participate in this kind of activity, and specifically the role of the state or policy creation in, in controlling, or as I say later, making co-ops creatures of, co of, of the state. And we often look at, say, the Soviet Union or other places and say, oh, this is terrible when the state creates co-ops and it's very bad for practice, but we don't critically reflect on our own context in the West about how much policy is directing uh, particular activities and co-op structures and practices. So really what I want to get at, and I avoided talking about Quebec or France in this presentation because I knew we had these two other speakers, but I think it applies there as well, is that there's a general sense that alternative Energy is a good thing in a general sense that co-ops will be successful. And certainly when Judith and I started this research, that was my assumption, probably less so hers, um, but it, it was an assumption. But what really has struck me over the last couple of years is that assumption was based on the idea that co-ops are effective market agents, why of capitalism. And it's not that they can't be or they won't be, but the role of the state and the public policy specifically outside of the context of the FIT program, I don't think has been talked about enough in the literature or thought about enough. And I'm trying to use alternative energy to think about that, but the cooperative sector more generally. And again, to get into this question of is there a cooperative difference? If, if there is, is it positive or is it negative? Or, as I, I'll tip my hand, I think it's a bit of both. So I, I want to get us to think about that in this context. So the general understanding of the co-op difference, and I, I think it's really actually an interesting question because it's a value proposition for a lot of people. We don't often think of concretizing the co-op difference. What exactly does it mean on the ground? But generally, it's the idea that co-ops are businesses done differently, that they have a social focus, a democratic content, and a concern for community. And I'm going to return to these themes in alternative energy at the end to try and pick up how I think that they can be realized in alternative energy. But we also don't think a lot about what are the factors that allow that cooperative difference to exist. And one of the assumptions is, I think, and I think we need to be critical about it, is that it's voluntaristic. Meaning that as long as the members pull together and do it right, it's going to happen. And I think that that's a dangerous assumption to make because it can lead to member burnout or problems. But we also don't operate freely in the world to do whatever we want to do as much as we might want to think of are that way. There are real structural issues. And here I'm bringing in sociology and political science into the conversation. Do you have a chance to get 10 minutes before the next session starts? As far as the demand for the benefits, um, just the fact that it is a unit, and the fact that we want to supposed to, you know, after that, the earth is going to we're absolutely not going to stop paying down your computer production. So the uh, the fact that you know, the fact that it's more black citizens who want to not go to the field of wants, you know. 
Do you feel that it's not a demonstrable benefit? You, like, I would just well up with God. I live on the wrong side of the auto river to my end. But, um, but that's not enough of a demonstrable benefit for people to just well up with God? I, I, personally, I, I, don't, I don't think it is. Uh, because I, I actually don't think that technology, solar is a different thing. I think solar actually is a much more, I can't get into all the details in that quick time, but has a much more democratic potential to it than the turbines. But I'm not actually sure, uh, and I've looked through the literature, that a wind turbine it ultimately creates a huge environmental benefit. I don't think that it creates the social benefits that co-ops are also supposed to bring. And I think the desire to buy with your wallet environmental change to me, I come from, I was in the environmental movement a long time ago. That kind of thought, environmental change, never works. And I think we've forgotten why we were critical of that in the 80s and in the 90s. It means actually fundamental transformation of how we live. So a wind turbine does nothing to tell me to do the best thing possible for the environment, which is to consume less. In fact, it, it mitigates and makes me feel better about consuming more because now I can buy a coal for our power, so I can run my lights all day long, and it's just wind turbines. There hasn't been a very good analysis of the whole production process of wind turbines, most of which are coming from other places that aren't being developed here yet, and the environmental cost of those, plus the breakdown component uh, and waste from turbines. When I was in Scotland, they were shown this huge field, and they said, all of those are going to be gone in six years. Where do they go? Well, it's Yes, I got that, and I said, so who, yeah, who's going to recycle those things? And birds. I don't know, I, I can disagree with you. I actually don't okay. think that, Cool birds. I mean, what we're talking about is an energy transition to uh, a renewable energy future. I actually think that, in, in Ontario in particular, what's motivating the Green Energy Act is in part the commitment by the government, federal government to get off the now, we're closer to that target than ever, not because of the one energy necessarily, but because of the recession. But at the same time, that's that was the impetus for, you know, among other things, for introducing the energy and trying out to be in there. So I don't think it's as easy as to say, well, we're just buying, it's just a monetary thing to buy ourselves out of the environmental prices. I actually think the fact that we're generating real, you know, electricity from renewable energy is one of the more concrete things you can do with your money these days, um, which is unlike, you know, buying, yeah, you know, buying, 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 Four group of people, some burn out, but people move in and out of the periphery. And then as it goes along, you know, there's less member involvement naturally because there isn't as much development work happening as well. And I guess the trick would be to somehow keep those people somewhat involved, especially if you want to expand. But uh, isn't there a natural progression of member involvement anyway? And, you know, so you're not going to have your 400 wheelchair members constantly at the pulse of wheelchair because. It's up. It's running. Mostly, <laughs> and uh, and it's doing its its thing. So, is there an expectation that a member would be constantly involved, right, all the way along? But then, my only argument that I'm trying to say is, is that why not do community power? Mm -hmm. What's the? I mean, this is the context of the co-op difference, mm -hmm. right? What? That's that's what I'm, all I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I have a question about uh, coupling the solar or alternative energy models to PRDs, and in particular to PRDs that are cooperatively owned. Has there been any exploration about that? Can you and are there yeah, uh, plan for extension development? For what? A plan for extension development would be a subsection, yeah, yeah. a subdivision, and if, you, and, and, and if you have a cooperative, or if you are, as is uh, the case in some parts of New England and in, in, in the USA, where they're, they're taking uh, manufactured home parts and converting those into planned residential developments and have the opportunity to build in with financing the introduction of alternative energy infrastructure, is, is this something that, that state policy 
could incentivize and that would lend financing for for the two. Sure. But really briefly, then then you've got state directed cooperative development. If, if, if we're talking about co-ops, the the energy thing. Judith and I can disagree all day long, but it, it's really the question that we're trying to focus on here, at least, in, is the co-op form providing difference in alternative energy? And that's a, an interesting example of where, in actual fact, if you believe in, in that this type of model reduces energy consumption or is better for the environment ultimately or whatever, you've got to look at whether or not this model is a good one. And that's an example where the state would be much better municipal than just saying, Every single development lead, lead certification requires solar panels. <laughs> I don't care who does it, but then there, where's the point? So we are out of time. <laughs> um, we do have the contact information for the presenters. Thank you, everybody.